the decision uh, to establish this new entity, this uh, UN Women, reflected a global concern on, um, with the low, slow pace of change. Uh, even though everybody in the global summit last year of the Millennium Development Goals uh, raised the issue that women, empowering women was essential in <coughs> achieving the Millennium Development Goals, when we look at the Millennium Development Goals, all of them who were linked to women's issue were the ones who have progressed slowly. For example, women's empowerment, uh, if we talk about political empowerment, <coughs> is probably the list of the goals that have been achieved. Uh, a percentage of 19% of female parliamentarians in the world, only 19 head of states and head of governments of 192 member states of the UN Na United Nations. So, on one hand, we saw that uh, in empowering, it was very slow. But also, when you look at Millennium Development Goal number four, number five, maternal mortality and, and children mortality, in maternal mortality, we're, even though progress has been made, uh, I cannot be happy with the progress. That means that 350,000 women die every year due to consequences of birth, giving birth or uh, during pregnancy. It's also not acceptable to live in a world where young girls are taken out of school and forced into early marriage, uh, where women's employment opportunities uh, are limited and where the threat of gender-based violence is a daily reality at home, at street, at school, or at work. And when I'm talking about violence, I'm talking about a global issue. I'm not talking about a problem with developing countries. In the developed world, this is a reality as, as, as well. When women were established uh, in affirmation of a simple fact that achieving women's uh, equality is a fundamental human right, but also not only a fundamental human right, but also a social and economic imperative. And as you may know, UN Women became operational from the 1st of January this year. And even though we will be working in many areas that impact or affect women's life, women's and girls' life worldwide, we have defined which are the areas where we'll be the leading ones, because there are other areas that there are other agencies who are leading, and we will be building partnership with them, we will be working with them, but will not be our five leading priorities. We, our priority is, first of all, to give women a voice and a face, if I may say. So it's enhancing women's voices, leadership, and participation, or we could also call it political empowerment. Second, uh, enhancing women's economic empowerment. I'm really convinced that there won't be any gender equality and the women will never have equal rights if they are not empowered. And it's very difficult to have equal rights if women don't have economic autonomy. So that's why economic empowerment is such a, a, a priority for us. And we're talking in, in two senses, in the sense of uh, women as workers, women as entrepreneurs, SMEs, so we, a lot of programs in terms of access to credit, access to technical assistance, um, improving their skills, managerial skills, improving their access to markets, just to mention some areas. Uh, um, access to land rights. In many countries of the world, in Africa particularly, women uh, are the most important force in the agriculture uh, force, la labor force. We also talk in on how we introduce gender parity in the corporate sector, in the private sector, how we introduce m more uh, important uh, top positions for female at the private sector, and also how we or, uh, give women's opportunities at the workplace. And we have, with, with Global Compact, we have developed sort of a seven, empower seven um, uh, principles of a women's empowerment at the workplace, and more than 130 uh, CEOs in different companies have signed these agreements and they're working on it. it it's definitely an initiative from avoiding uh, uh, harassment at the workplace to uh, giving opportunities to women and also to put more women at top positions. The third is, uh, enhance, um, is ending violence against women. We still need to end violence against women and girls. And the fourth is, of course, uh, strengthening um, the participation women voices, needs, and concerns in the heart of the peace and security agenda. We celebrated last year 10 years of Resolution, Security Council Resolution 1325, that it was raised 10 years ago because there was a so clear conscience that even though women were part of the conflict as agents of peace, uh, or sometimes as women combatants, sometimes women were soldiers also, 
or many times women were victims and they were raped and they were, uh, their families were killed. And afterwards, when the peace uh, agreements were, were, were developed, they, were, they disappeared from the map. They were never part of the peace, treatment, of the peace uh, agreement. There is a, a, a study uh, uh, made of uh, f more than 500 peace agreements after 1990. And in only in 16 of those more than 500, the word women is mentioned one or twice. And only in eight of them, the word sexual violence was mentioned, even though in all of those countries, women had a specific impact on the conflict against them. And second, sexual violence was used as a means of war. So uh, I mentioned you to this to, to, to show you that uh, still, because women are powerless, they are not considered in the peace agreement. So what happens then? That they're not considered then in terms of reparation, in terms of um, uh, have access to justice or whatever the women needed. And also they're not considered when they're reshaping the society after, uh, after the conflict. And this is a very contingent issue.